Good evening. Uh, welcome to another edition of EML. The last time we met was on April 21st for a lecture by Mr. Arvind Nilakantan. Uh, after a three month hiatus, we are here to kick off another season of extramural lectures. Uh, for the benefit of those who are here for the very first time, I'll, I hope I can, you can excuse me for sharing a few words about the EML. The extramural lecture series began in the 1980s under the able guidance of the then prof, uh, director, Professor Indresan. Over the years, it has grown by leaps and bounds and has become an institution by itself. We have breached all kinds of barriers to bring in speakers from diverse backgrounds, be it cinema, sports, public administration, social service, among others. Over the years, our students have benefited from speakers like Dr. APJ Abdul Kalam, Sri V. S. Sampath, Sri N. Gopalaswamy, Sri Montek Singh Aluwalia, Dr. Y. V. Reddy, Sri N. R. Narayana Murthy, Dr. M. S. Swaminathan, and a multitude of other names. Last year, we traversed the seas to bring an international speaker, the renowned literary figure, Mr. Jeffrey Archer. This year, we look to expand into uncharted territories, and as a first step in that direction, I am proud to present to you the first ever budget discussion in the 30 year history of the extramural lectures. <laughs> Has Arun Jaitley lost it? Or is it a measured stance of a well planned and to be implemented strategy? To analyze this and more and its implications for you, me, and for all other stakeholders in the country, we have with us four eminent panelists from diverse backgrounds. I would like to introduce them to you. First, we have Mr. T.T. Srinivas Raghavan, who is the Managing Director of Sundaram Finance Limited, one of India's largest retail finance service players with assets of over 8,400 crores. Mr. Srinivas Raghavan has vast experience in the banking and finance sectors and serves as the President of the International Finance and Leasing Association United Kingdom. We also have with us Mr. Prakash Damodaran, IAS. Mr. Prakash has had an eventful career with the Indian Administrative Service for 22 years. He was the first ever IT Secretary to the Government of Tamil Nadu and serves on the board of several public and private sector corporations. He is an alumnus of IIT Madras, IIM Calcutta and has a Masters in Public Administration from the Kennedy School of Government, Harvard. A third panelist who is yet to join us is Mr. V. Murli, a practicing chartered accountant and an elected Central Council member of the Institute of Chartered Accountants of India for four consecutive terms. He is the President of the All India Taxpayers Association and serves on the board of the State Bank of India, Naval Ignite Corporation and among other institutions. We also have with us Dr. Lakshmi Kumar, who today will don an additional role of being the moderator apart from the panelist. Professor Lakshmi Kumar is an Associate Professor and Program Director at IFMR with over 15 years of experience in research and training. Prior to IFMR, she worked in the Madras Chamber of Commerce and Industry as an economist and has been involved with numerous academic institutions. Her primary areas of interest are in understanding development issues, rural livelihoods and analysis of government provided basic services. She has been part of various field based studies in India, particularly in Tamil Nadu, including projects sponsored by Harvard, NSC and University of California, Irvine. May I now call upon Professor Lakshmi Kumar to take over the discussion. Thank you, Sudarshan, for this uh, very nice introduction. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to be here because I was a student of DOMS, a uh, doctoral student of DOMS, having learned so much here, having also taught micro and macroeconomics here. So it feels a great uh, sense of pleasure to be back here. I also am very indebted to this department for having taught me so much, and to my mentor, Professor L.S. Ganesh, who is present here. <laughs> having said this, let me get straight on to the budget. One of the things that we really, all of us anticipated, while the rhetoric of the election was on, is an anticipation that the budget is going to provide an absolute change. The budget itself is something that we expected is going to provide something that the slowdown that the economy had 
having had a huge increase in uh, economic growth from 2000 to 2008, a nice 8 to 9 percent growth which helped in the tax buoyancy. And after 2008, we found that there were two problems plaguing the economy, rightfully or wrongfully analyzed. One was inflation and the other was growth slowdown. So therefore, the expectation rightfully by most people was that the budget is going to provide an impetus for growth and stall inflation. Well, one must add as a macroeconomist that I am analyzing today, first giving you the facts and figures that for 2013-14, the three most important sectors that we expect growth from, agriculture, industry, and services. Probably the best sector that we expect growth is agriculture, around 4%, compared to the previous year, which was just 1%. Industry has completely slowed down to less than 1%. Whereas it did provide a better uh, growth uh, the previous year. Services sector, which was providing more than 9% growth between 2000 to 2008, slipped to a less than 6% growth. And therefore, the overall growth rate slipped down to 4.5%. And expected growth of about 5% is expected next year. How? So the question comes to, we go on to the fiscal deficit or and the revenue deficit. So there are, there's basically one very important macro view that we have to look at. In the fiscal deficit, can we look at, one, is the revenue expenditure going to go up, come down? And is there going to be any increase in capital expenditure? Why? Because only capital expenditure, or as we call as the fiscal stimulus, will help spur economic growth. So when you look at closely how the budget document is made, and when we make an assessment of the budget document, one thing becomes very clear. There seems very little change, an increase in capital expenditure from 1.68% to 1.76%. We really seem to be caught in what we call as a vicious cycle. The vicious cycle being, if we want to spur growth, we need to increase capital expenditure. And if we need to actually bring about the increased taxes, which will help us, we need to bring about this increase in capital expenditure, which we are not able to bring about because we are not able to have more taxes right now available. The whole thing big brings to one question is, how can we bring about an increase in this capital expenditure? What was expected was, to break this vicious circle, an 18 percent expenditure on subsidies could have been cut down probably, bold steps. There are two things which were expected. One is bold steps in terms of subsidy cut, 18 percent of what comes in goes towards subsidies. One is not talking, or I am not talking in terms of subsidies cut to the poor people. But you can think in terms of cut in subsidies. For example, diesel, you can think in terms of gas cylinder, but that was not done. Second, in terms of, there has been an indication of FDI increases, but is it good enough? But what has been done is disinvestment. It has been proclaimed that instead of 23,000 crores disinvestment money, we can probably increase it to 65,000 crores. Time and again, what has been done is disinvestment has been used towards our expenditure. Is this a good idea or not? As an economist, I think that often selling off the silver of the house in order to take care of your revenue expenditure is not a really a good idea. So this is my basic remarks because I think as a macroeconomist, this is probably very important to understand. Pessimistic as I might sound, the optimism is there are small good steps in the budget. The small good steps are expenditure on infrastructure, expenditure on health, expenditure on education. Sometimes small steps 
an indication towards fiscal consolidation by 2017, these go a long way in showing that because small steps probably are implementable as compared to making loud noises and not implementing anything at all. So with these words, I will ask the next panelist to make his remarks and we will go ahead. Thank you. Good evening. I think properly uh, on behalf of all my fellow panelists, I should uh, apologize to all of you for having, you made, having made you wait for a good 25 minutes beyond starting time for a variety of reasons, including Chennai traffic, but uh, apologies are in order. Sorry. Uh, yeah, I think uh, Lakshmi sort of laid out the canvas very well and very extensively. There's just a couple of things I'd like to pick up from what she said. Fiscal deficit, inflation. I think what we are faced with as an economy, as a country, are essentially sort of paradoxes. Right? We have very, very compelling forces on two extreme ends. And I guess the struggle for everyone is about finding balance. Everyone talks about fiscal deficit. And correctly. But there is an equally strong argument on the other side which says fiscal deficit be damned. Right? What this country needs is growth and it needs growth which will generate employment. Right? There is a very good reason for that argument. And th these are not my views. I am just stating the case. The argument goes like this. We've had, you know, very impressive 8, 9, whatever percent growth over the last 10 years, ending 2008, 2009. But not all of that growth was employment generating growth. And there is a large body of opinion which says what we need today in this country more than anything else is that kind of growth, employment generating growth. That, I think, is a, a fairly powerful argument. And if you tie that in with the jargon which you often hear of demographic dividend, right? Everybody talks about the demographic dividend, you know, how India has whatever, 60 percent of its population is between 18 and 65, da 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 da. The flip side of that is you've got whatever this translates into, 300 and 50, 400 million young people, not unlike you, who come out armed with degrees, good, bad, indifferent, but they're all armed with degrees and they have aspirations. So if our economic growth does not meet those aspirations, and you know, aspirations are aspirations. They don't necessarily have to be based on logic, right? And if, as an economy, as a country, we are not able to fulfill, at least in part, the aspirations of our youth, then this demographic dividend can actually become a demographic time bomb. And I think that is a very important fact that policymakers have to take cognizance of. From time to time, even now, you see signs of this. I mean, a lot of what they call Maoist, Naxalite, whatever, uh, unrest. I'm not so sure that, at least in part, it is driven by this phenomenon of people who have equipped themselves to be gainfully employed, have not been provided the opportunity, and therefore, you know, they go into areas which perhaps as a society we shouldn't be allowing them to do. So that's, that's one part. Fiscal deficit, yes or no. The other one is also a conflict, growth or inflation targeting. 
right? That's what the Reserve Bank goes on about all the time. In the new dispensation, inflation targeting is paramount, right? The Reserve Bank is actually on record saying that they don't mind if the economy doesn't grow, but inflation control is priority number one, two, and three, right? And again, depending on which side of the divide you're on, right, you would believe that one view is right or the other is. And I think it's important for an audience like this, for, for people from our backgrounds, it's, it's important to understand, which is where, you know, this part about subsidy. Do we need gas cylinders at 450 rupees? I think not. I think we can afford to pay whatever it is that a gas cylinder costs. But unfortunately, we have become a society of entitlements, right? Everybody believes that they are entitled to freebies, regardless of whether their economic situation justifies it or not. That, to my mind, is at the heart of many of our problems. So when the Reserve Bank says inflation targeting, that is essentially aimed at the large body of really poor people in this country. Because for them, inflation is hard reality. Whereas for the, the intellectual elites, inflation is still something that is a discussion subject around a table, a discussion subject in forums like these. The pinch, I'm sure there is a pinch, but it's a relatively mild pinch. But for those at the bottom of the pyramid, the pinch of inflation is very, very real. So again, you have the conflict of one side of the opinion saying we need to control inflation so we can sacrifice growth. And then you have industry and you have chambers of commerce and everybody else saying that unless we have growth, where will employment come from? Where will we see 8% growth, so on and so forth? So these are paradoxes. They don't have easy answers. So as we look at what the finance minister has tried to do with this budget, it's important to keep these factors in the backdrop. Honestly, I think the finance minister of this country has the second lousiest job in this country. The lousiest job is the prime minister's job. Right? Because no matter what you do, you lose. Right? Damned if you do, damned if you don't. And to be, to be perfectly honest, I think what these guys have inherited is terrible. Right? After 10 years of yeah, you know, record freebies, these guys have inherited a pretty dismal uh, economic uh, situation. You have the food subsidy bill, which no one is even still talking about loudly enough. But based on the little bit that I understand, and maybe Prakash has a better handle on how this food subsidy works, but the, the numbers that I've read and heard are pretty scary. I think that alone can potentially bankrupt this country. So we've got, you know, we've got all of these, I mean, she talked about subsidies, right? The food subsidy is also one kind of subsidy. And again, where do you draw the line in terms of who needs this subsidy and who doesn't? Where do you draw lines, right? Because the poverty in this country is very, very real, right? And unless we can address that, all of this growth which we are talking about, all this glitch that we see in terms of 8 and 9 percent growth still leaves a significant percentage of our population completely untouched. And to me, that is not a growth model that we can sustain over time. So I think I will, I will stop there. Thank you. Uh, for the benefit of the audience, I would like to introduce uh, Mr. Murli. Mr. Murli is a practicing chartered accountant and is an elected member of the Institute of, elected member of the Executive Council of the Institute of Chartered Accountants of India for four consecutive years. He currently serves on the board of Navy Ignite Corporation, the State Bank of Hyderabad, and other institutions. 
He is also the president of the Taxpayers Association of India. We now call upon Mr. Murli to give his opening remarks on the budget. Dr. Lakshmi Kumar, Mr. T. T. Srinivas Raghavan, Mr. Prakash Damodaran, students, invitees, guests and dear friends. At the outset, I thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity, an excellent opportunity to share some of my thoughts on the implications of the budget with reference to individual taxpayers. And first of all, I appreciate, I feel it is a very prestige to come and address in the campus of IIT. The continuous professional learning is required, macro learning is required, big picture is required. A learning, continuous professional learning should be both intellectual based and value based. Intellectual based education influences the head, whereas the value based education influences the heart. When the head and the heart go together, you need not worry about the feet, it will go in the right direction. From that angle, I appreciate this. We always say awareness creation is very important. We are all cream of the society, cream of the intelligentsia. So, uh, I am a chartered accountant. The motto of our institute is Yayeshu Subdeshu Jagiradi, meaning thereby we should be awake while others are asleep. That is the role of the intelligentsia in a country like ours where the illiteracy is rampant. So, the message is that aware, beware, care, share, dare, be fair, because you are all very rare. Joining IIT is not a you know, so they are coming and talking about budget proposal to this cream of the society, very elite section. I feel I am very privileged. When it comes to the direct tax proposal, first you must understand what is the slab, what is the taxation structure from the angle of an individual taxpayer. Presently, we have 2 lakhs is the exemption limit. 2 lakhs to 5 lakhs, it is 10 percent. There are 3 slabs, 10, 10, 20 and 30 plus education says is that 2 plus 1. And uh, once you cross it, super rich tax also was uh, imposed last year. That is also there. So now presently, 2 to 5, it is 10 percent. 5 to 10, it is 20 percent. 10 lakhs and above, it is 30 percent plus applicable surcharge, education says. Now it is increased from 2 lakh to 2 lakh 50,000 for non-senior citizens, less than 60 years of age. We have got a uh, you know, senior citizens is 60 years and above, super senior citizens means 80 years and above. So, it is 2 lakhs, it is increased to 2.5. So, the resultant slab is 2.5 to 5, it is 10 percent, 5 to 10, 20, afterwards it is 30. Now, when you come to the uh, senior citizens, from 2.5, it is increased to 3 lakhs. So, 3 to 5 lakhs, 10, 20, 30 like that, 10 lakhs and above it is 30. For super senior citizens, the first slab, 10 percent slab is uh, already taken away. So, they start with 20 percent only. So, it is 5 lakhs to 10 lakhs, 20, 10 lakhs and above it is 30. It is retained same. There is no change at all here. So, what happened? A person will be able to tax plan. Last year also it was given. How it was given? 87A, a rebate was given. 2000 for those people whose taxable income does not exceed 5 lakhs. Very, very restricted uh, you know, uh, give away. Now it is 87A is not touched. That means 2,50 is the minimum slab means plus you can add 20,000 if your taxable income does not exceed 5 lakhs. That means up to 2,70 no tax for those people whose taxable income not exceeded 5 lakhs. So, 2,80 it is 1,030. If you take senior citizens, 2,50 to 3 lakhs they have made up to 3,20 nothing, 3,30 it starts with 1,030. Senior citizens, if you take 5 lakhs only is the starting point, 5 lakh 10,000, it is 2060, it will start. This is the basic uh, exemption model and tax structure model for individual tax assessees. Otherwise, whatever rates was there last year, it continued to be there. And here I have to appreciate the Honorable Finance Minister Arun Jaitley, sir. For uh, 50,000, no finance minister has given. Do not go by the paper. People say 5 lakhs he could have given, they made a promise, they made a simplification. They try to see banking transaction as a methodology of taxing the thing, all that is not possible at all. So, that is all election oriented thing. What you have to see, you have to compare 50,000 anyone has given from the independent India, right from Shanvam Chetty to current Arun Jaitley, you have to compare. It is 10,000, 20,000, no exemption like that they have given. 
we always say taxpayers association cost of living index whatever they give the indexation whatever they give for capital gains which has crossed 1000 you take the base period as 1481 if it is 100 today it is fixed more than 1000 for indexation benefit for capital gains calculation long term the same thing should be applicable for anything exemption limit or atc or section 24 whatever it is there should be indexation benefit to see that what is the real worth of the concession as such this is the first point the second one is atc atc again more and more concessions have been given it is bundled out bundled in a one single deduction as section atc which is a deduction you must know the base of uh, taxation first is normally income from salary income from house property income from profits or gains income from capital gains income from other sources five heads are there any income whoever you are earning it will come under these five heads there will be respective deductions from the respective heads the total it's called gross total income from there chapter 6 year deductions are given starting with the atc as such the balance is taxable income then tax payable then less tds the balance payable or refundable will be there self assessment to 140 advance this is a structure broad structure here atc from the gross total income what are all the deduction is there atc 1 lakh to 1 lakh 50000 so the here also we have to appreciate no finance minister has given atc this much concession in the history i am telling you it has been kept in a way very very small only he has given 50000 again he should be appreciated and the best deduction under section atc there are so many things are there national savings certificate five year tax saver deposit is there principal repayment of staff housing loan is there like that so many is there you have our equity linked savings scheme but the best is public provident fund especially for people who are in the self employed category or people like professionals or non salaried assessees that is the best one is public provident fund because it is based on the premise exempt 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 it is called triple e while contributing it is exempt while accretions interest is exempt the maturity also exempt so that is the best possible but of course here also our association always represent 8.7 percent only they give they give for employee 9 9 percent they give 0.3 is more so when uh, mr karge sir was there employment and labor when he was there also we have given a memorandum to him why you make a distinction between the public provident fund and employee provident fund why you are denying us you should not do that we have given he said he will consider before that he was transferred to railway ministry so what is important is that he has given there is no windfall i want to tell you in this uh, country especially mr modi ji what is following there should not be windfall to anybody everybody has to pay a price that is the thing but there are certain exceptions because in the dry taxation i would like to make one anecdote yeah mother in law wanted to test the integrity of her three sons in law so what she has done when the first son in law was around she is emerging in a river actually then the first son in law jumps and saves the mother in law mother in law happy she gives a maruti car to him as a gratitude again uh, she does it before the second son in law second son in law also jumps and saves and this time she gives a motorcycle and the third son in law she tries to do this unfortunately he happens to be a chartered accountant so he always say the risk and reward return on investment so much uh, that person is there like a portfolio investment so he thought uh, so much uh, hefty body we have to carry to the shore first he got maruti car second is a motorcycle the third one when his turn comes it may be resulting in a cycle only so is it necessary to take that type of risk to have having studied portfolio dow jones theory chartist approach fundamental approach and all so when she tried this trick uh, actually he allowed her permanently immersed in the river actually so then uh, here the father in law has given a mercedes benz to the third son in law so <laughs> <laughs> this is called as a windfall concept actually but you should not look with suspicion anyone owning a mercedes benz actually so but then when the opportunity does not knock you have to build the door that is the way we look at things as such i know a person who is having 100 houses highest net worth person so i know people who are there owning 80 houses 70 houses and all that and today housing companies they are giving also a liberal one so when you have a emi calculation out of the total emi lion share is going to the interest so you will be able to adjust a large amount of interest you can adjust it against the salary income thereby huge deduction a person is getting provided he has the ability to service the debt 
whereas uh, average middle income group who are self occupied to make this 1 lakh 50 to 2 lakh 50 thousand rupees although it's a big sum but there is no comparable if it is let out you can claim municipal taxes you can claim water taxes you can get 30 percent of the total annual rent you can claim as a deduction unlimited interest you can claim it is not 2 lakhs i know a client of mine who is claiming 52 lakhs that means uh, mostly most of the salary there is no limit he has given as such so there is a bias is there but anyhow it is for a self-occupied property two lakhs he has given the gesture we are appreciating it so when it comes to the capital gains each head salary is over house property then it comes to the capital gains it's a very very attractive provision this particular chapter capital gains capital assets when you are selling it here there is a section called 54 that is when you are selling a house property you reinvest in another house property it is exempt you can own 100 houses you can sell 100 houses there is no limit whatever capital gains as long as you are investing in another house property it is totally exempt this is called section 54 no limit nothing and here what happened there is one particular thing suppose if you are selling a property today a person is selling a uh, you know big land in Tinaga and he has got four sons so four individual house property flats he is constructing and all the fla four flats he can cl he is claiming as a deduction against the uh, taxation of capital gains against the capital gains he is showing as a deduction so there is a Madras High Court decision where in a complex he buys four earlier what they do one flat itself one municipal number they will have uh, two houses so what is they say what is a uh, house means it should be habitable that is what oxford dictionary says that means if you have four houses adjacent to one connected to a single door four kitchen everything will be there but he claim it as a one house but after the court decision has come individually they started by with the individual municipal number now here they have what they have put here you can invest only one house property if you are selling a big land also it is restricted to one house property only what is one house property one municipal number is treated as a one property yeah one property includes plural that was the connotation now they made it one and you can buy house abroad also earlier now specifically they have said that the reinvestment should be in india only the house property should be situated in india and you cannot buy more than one the same thing 54 f this is house property to house property suppose you have other than house property land gold bullion jewelry art painting heritage sculpture all those things if you are selling and if you are reinvesting in another house property also there is no plural only one property you can buy this is 54 f there is another one is there suppose i am aged person i am 80 years old so i cannot manage the property i want to sell the property and invest in a financial instruments other than the house property i want to do it whether is there any restriction what happened the previous honorable finance minister earlier regime he restricted to 50 lakhs only he has not given more than that now 50 lakhs per financial year he brought it actually now what they have done suppose if you are selling a house property in december that means financial year april to march three months is over in one financial year three months will come in another financial year so people used to invest 50 lakhs one financial year another uh, thing another 50 lakhs so it cannot exceed cap as restricted to 50 lakhs there is another change they have made it and like that many uh, thing another one i want to tell you that uh, all india taxpayers association i personally met mr arun jaitley sir and we have given a memorandum you know he three portfolios main portfolios is holding it is all important portfolios and the time allotted is less than two months and most of the things earlier whoever his predecessor did it he could not change it so in between whatever uh, you know mr modi's dream project like interlinking of ports or infrastructure or aviation all those things whatever he could do it he has brought in as such but still there are certain areas where the predecessor kept it he doesn't have a time to rectify which he will be doing it now but one thing i want to tell you there is a draconian provision introduced by the previous uh, predecessor in case if the expenses are disallowed if the tds is not deducted 100 percent will be disallowed in computing the income there was a provision brought what is that suppose one crore you have paid to a contractor subcontractor one percent you have to deduct if you don't deduct one percent 
100 rupees will be disallowed. This is a draconian. It is like Saudi Arabia. This limb only did it, na? you cut it. This is a thing you did, cut it. That is equivalent to that, actually. We do not follow that jurisprudence here, justice delivery system. Whereas here, what he has done, 100% will be disallowed. That was the provision. We have given a reminder, we have given a memorandum, no listening. But here, this gentleman did it. Only 30 per the disallowance itself is wrong because there is a penalty, there is a prosecution, everything is there. But why you try to bring in? That's what we said. So he said we cannot make such a drastic change. So 30 percent, he reduced from 100 percent. That shows the magnanimity. That is also I am telling you that everywhere you don't compare what is the expectations may be more. See, when Sardar Vallabhai Patel, when he uh, presided over a doctor's conference, there is allopathy doctors, homeopathy doctors. They were fighting. Who represents the true medicine, actually? So, the, what happened? He has to come and tell. We only represent the true medicine. Sardar Vallabhai Patel, India's iron man came. He took the mic. He has to do the arbitration. Whether it is homeopathy or allopathy, that is not important. You must have sympathy and empathy. That is what you required and he said. That is what is required. It is not only passion. You must have compassion. You must have empathy, not apathy. This is what important towards the tax paying public over uh, inflation, no? So much is there. So, he introduced so many things. Another, uh, I do not want to take, but I want to tell you, transfer pricing, MNC, Vodafone, Nokia, retrospective amendment, all those things he has tried to do, actually ensure IIT, IEM, infrastructure, so many things he has done, 22,000 crores he has given, despite there is a resource constraints he has done. Then the sunset claim is the power sector, 10 years benefit, investment allowance for manufacturing company, everything is given within the available time. So what is important is that we have to appreciate certain uh, very good things, what he has done it. And uh, they say in a bus, if the conductor sleeps, you need not take the ticket. If the driver sleeps, everyone has to take the ticket to the ultimate heaven, actually. So intelligentsia like that, you have to do it. I also said some people bring happiness wherever they go. Some people bring happiness whenever they go. Unless they go, there is no happiness actually. There are also people are there. But I am telling you this finance minister, at least for the middle class, at least from the tax perspective, he has brought cheers and he has come. Wherever he goes, he will bring cheer. That is what I hope as such. Wish you all the best. Thanks for the opportunity given. May I now call upon Mr. Prakash Damodaran to share his thoughts on the budget. Thank you. Good evening. Always a pleasure to be back at IIT Madras. One of the advantages of uh, speaking last, that now I can confidently say, I wanted to say all that. Whatever they said, I also wanted to say that. Had I come before them, I would have said all that. Anyway, jokes apart, I think this was very illuminating. And uh, uh, I, for my own personal education, jotted down quite a few things. And I do plan to consult Mr. Murli when filing my tax returns next time. <laughs> I'm not going to talk on the technical aspects of the budget, which has been covered uh, in a fair amount of detail by uh, our distinguished panelists. I want to touch upon uh, something which generally is not debated much, which is the political and governance aspects of the budget. Is that okay? Uh, politics, you know, there is, uh, okay, how many of you thinks politics is good? Raise your hands. How many of you think politics is bad? Surprising. I thought it would be the other way around. I know. There is hope for the country. There is a joke I read saying politics, the origin of the word, I was looking about the etymology. You know? Origin of the word, it says two parts, poly and ticks. Now, poly all of you know is, you know, many, like polymer and uh, polynomial and all that. And tick is this blood-sucking parasite which you find on dogs. <laughs> so, politics is large number of blood-sucking parasites. That is an interpretation I got in something called Urban Dictionary, which I thought was good. Cool. <laughs> Incidentally, by way of uh, full disclosure, nothing of what I am going to say is original. Everything has been, thanks to the net which was not there when I was a student, I can become an instant expert. So, 
I will not be attributing, uh, you know, the proper intellectual property rights to the various people, but I must have copied from a lot of places. Now, copy and paste is a great Indian skill, and I am sure all of you have mastered it also as well. <laughs> if you are not, now is the time. It's called Control C, Control V technology. It was invented in India. The actual meaning of the word politics, <laughs> coming back to more serious things, it's derived from a Greek word called politikos, means relating to citizens. I am told it arose from Aristotle's writings. So, it is not relating to people, it is relating to citizens. Citizen means you are part of a state. So, in operational terms, all political activity deals with how you achieve and you exercise powers and how you govern. It's governance related. And any political system is just a framework for delivering governance. So there is nothing uh, inherently bad or good about politics. It is what the persons who operate the system make it out to be. By itself, it is fairly value neutral. So that, having said that, is the budget a political document? What is the general view? Or is it an economic document? Great. It is a pure political document with economic overtones. This is uh, my interpretation. Having seen the budget from the inside of government, it is a political document with economic overtones and there are a few numbers. And the numbers can be whatever you want them to be. Uh, Mr. Murli, my apologies. You know what I am saying. <laughs> now, why have you heard of uh, so much tamasha being made of presentation of the budget of any other country? Now, we always read all sorts of papers and uh, online stuff and so on and so forth. Have you heard uh, so much of Tamasha of the UK budget or the US budget or the France budget or any other budget? So why are we making such a big deal out of it? This is something which I always used to wonder. Why do we make such a big deal out of this budget document? It is finally a bunch of numbers. And it is finally a bunch of numbers which are not numbers of reality. These are numbers of projections saying that this is what we want to do over the next one year. So you can put any number there. You want to add a few zeros, no problem. You want to deduct a few zeros, no problem. So personally, I was never clear even during all my years in government why this budget is such a big deal. Now the good part is the entire system of bureaucracy that we have, which is very large, nobody inside the government takes the budget seriously. Everybody outside the government takes it seriously and people who take it most seriously are the media analysts. Now these guys I think have run out of issues. There was this, you know, World Cup happened later, there was budget, before that there was election, there was something else. So they were looking for an issue saying this budget was built up to be a life-changing event. And when the budget was actually presented and analyzed, having built it up to be a life-changing event, and they found that maybe it is not all that life changing. Maybe life goes on as usual. You know, the sun rises in the east, nothing happens. There is no big bang as they call it. Now, it appears to have taken certainly the media by surprise. But I don't think anybody who is in the professional world was really taken by surprise. That's my own personal feeling. What is the constitutional provision about the budget? Any of you have any idea? And why is this budget presented? Why is there so much uh, you know, tamasha? I also had a doubt, so I looked it up. There are two articles in our constitution, which are a large number of articles. There are only two articles which deal with the budget. One which deals with state budget, one deals with the union budget. Article 112 is the article which deals with the union budget. Let me just read it out. This is all the law enjoins the government to do. Everything else which is done by the government is so much of you know fluff. The President shall, in respect of every financial year, cause to lay before both Houses of Parliament a statement of the estimated receipts and expenditure of the Government of India for that year. 
and this shall be referred to as the annual financial statement. This is the operative part of Article 12, 112. And there is a whole lot of other stuff given below. This is the details. You know, what is charged to the budget, what is voted and so on and so forth. It is a one sentence. The entire law of the land which we have given unto ourselves at some point of time calls for an annual financial statement which is a statement of estimated receipts and expenditure for the year to be laid before the parliament. So, let us say next year a new finance minister is there on the job. If he comes up with a single sheet generated in Excel and lays it before everybody saying, okay, you wanted estimated revenues and expenditure, I have given it to you. Now, if you want details, contact me in my office. He would have complied with the law. This is all the budget is. This is really the core of the budget. There is nothing more than this. Now, each of us has a personal budget. Your students, you have a budget. You know your income. Maybe you generate it. Maybe your parents give it. You know your expenditure. And you know approximately what you're going to spend, say, during the month of July, August, and so on. The government of India's budget is nothing more than a bigger version of this. this is a lot more zeros. Now, unlike corporate accounts, which have to be maintained as per double entry bookkeeping and you know all that stuff, which you must have studied here, accrual basis, government of India's budgeting is very simple. It is single entry, it's cash basis. Therefore, to be finance minister, without any disrespect to the person holding the post, if you know how to add, you can be finance minister. All you do is tell all the departments of government saying, okay boss, how much are you going to earn this year? Each person will give you a number. How much are you going to spend? They will give you a number. Then you apply a sigma across all departments. You have the budget. That is all it is in essence. Now, the speech which is made, incidentally, Article 202 is for the states. Same thing. Have you heard of Tamil Nadu budget is going on? Has there been any hoopla about it in the press? It's also an important budget. It's a large state, 70 million people, larger than many countries in Europe. Nobody talks about it because it's just an accounting statement. Now, why this has become such a big deal is over a period of time, our uh, political leaders have found it expedient to use this as a political tool to give a political message, saying this is what we plan to do, this is what I'm going to do, and this is what may happen, and so on and so forth. And it's such a long, tedious document. The budget speech is around, uh, this time it's 16,000 words. It's not a joke, 16,000 words. Try writing a thousand words is painful. And the finance bill, which is the real meat of the thing, is a densely worded document which no human being can understand. Try going through the finance bill. It's all downloadable from the net. Just for the fun of it, just go, go through the finance bill. And finally, when the budget gets passed, download the Appropriation Act and the Finance Act 2014 and compare it clause by clause to the finance bill. So, really, this is a technical part of the budget. Now, the rest of the stuff, you know, whether there was a missed opportunity, whether big bang reforms were not done, whether subsidies were not cut, and so on and so forth, all stem from how much money you have in your kitty. Now, you can think of doing great things. All revenues come essentially from two sources. One is taxes, direct, indirect. And second source is borrowing. Third is you can get somebody outside the country to invest in your country. This is called FDI or FII, or whatever. In no other source. Unlike you and I, government has a great advantage that it can print notes. And it runs out of money, it can print notes, which adds to inflation and money supply and so on and so forth, which you would have learnt in macro. But this is something which you and I cannot do as individuals. Corporates cannot do it. They have to earn what they have to spend or they have to borrow. The government can borrow from the future by printing notes. But that leads to your real exchange rate falling and so on and so forth. There are all sorts of macroeconomic defects. I won't go into that. Now, to cut this long story short, there is a very interesting article today in uh, Hindu, I don't know how many of you saw it, by Professor Ram Mohan of IIM Ahmedabad. He has analyzed the budget, given his perspectives. He says two, three things. One is, Mr. Okay, just a preceding remark. See, the budget, from what I understand, has to be laid before both houses of parliament, but it's only passed by the Lok Sabha. It doesn't get passed by the Rajya Sabha. It doesn't need to get passed by the Rajya Sabha. Now, as you all know, the ruling party has an absolute majority in Lok Sabha. They could have gotten anything passed. They could have said that we will send a rocket to, you know, Neptune. It would have been passed. 
because we have absolute majority, you really do not need to worry about opposition. Why did not they do all that? The question you have to ask yourself is, why is there no great big bang as they call it reform? Why is the subsidies on you know diesel not cut? Why is the subsidies on fertilizer not cut? Why is the food subsidies, I think somebody mentioned it, not cut? And so on and so forth. Any ideas? Why is uh, so, uh, the retrospective taxation, which is so famous now, what a phone case. Why was that law not amended? Why did Mr. Jaitley not say, no, no, this is all nonsense, we will not do retrospective taxation? Why did they do not do all this? Fair enough. Because finally it is a political document. And when you deal with politics, you have your constituencies to worry about. You have the large number of poor people who voted you. You have the small middle class, but which is very vocal. But the noise the middle class makes, makes it look very large. In numbers, it does not matter. And you have the very wealthy, who are numerically very small. This is what is called top 1 percent or top 0 0.1 percent. To them, none of this matters. Budget can be anything you want. The middle class is most worried about personal income tax, which Mr. Murli spoke about, ATC and uh, all this stuff. But the number of taxpayers in India who pers file personal income tax returns, what is the figure, I think? It is couple of million. We have a population of more than a thousand million. So the ATC and 854 EC and so on and so forth, all these things, which you know personally I am concerned with because I am part of the middle class. The numbers are not very small. So just to keep these guys happy, you increase few things here and there, no problem. The real constituency is the people who voted you to power and they are the rural masses who are not really affected by ATC and so on. You cannot touch all these subsidies because if you touch those subsidies, you probably get booted out of power and you will have a huge political backlash. So, it is a political document, there is a ship of, you know, state is considered, always referred to a ship of state because it is very big. Assume you are a captain of a big ship, huh? aircraft carrier type, which is big, powerful, India 10th largest economy in the world, nominal terms, PPP terms, you know PPP, right? PPP terms, your third largest economy in the world, this is a very big ship compared to all these chota ships. You can't make a ship, if you are captain of a giant ship, you can't, you know, steer it or drive it like you drive a motorbike. It's not like a fighter plane, it, it can't do loops, it can't do tight U-turns, you can't do 4G turn in the ship. I am vaguely remembering some aero stuff I remember, <laughs> so I was taught long back. You can't do all that. When you maneuver a ship, if you want to turn there, you have to start here and you do it very gently. Ships can't do this, right? So that being the case, when you are steering the ship of state, you can't do abrupt maneuvers, you can't do tight turns, you can't do all this stuff, you can't do about face, you can't say, Achha, I was heading north, suddenly I'll head south, you can't do that. You, even if you take a U-turn, it'll take 100 kilometers, it'll take time. So this is why my personal feeling is the budget has a lot of small things in the fine print which you will read about in the papers, various things about small scale industries and so on and so forth privatization, etc., etc., whatever. But the f basics are not very different. That's why Economic Times said this is Chidambaram's budget with what? Saffron lipstick, right? But it could not have been any different. See, one quarter of the year is already gone. You are left with nine months of the year. Nine months of the year, you do a partial job. Plus, remember, I said it's a political document. You have state elections coming up in Maharashtra, Haryana, Jharkhand. Delhi's assembly election is a question mark, but it may happen before the end of the year, maybe depending on the result of these, maybe otherwise. These are big things from a politician's point of view. You cannot do anything to upset the possible outcomes of these elections. Having consolidated uh, 282 seats in Lok Sabha, it's a good idea to have large states also with you, with your party. So, it is not going to happen. And then there is this question mark about this monsoon. See, India's curse is the monsoon. It is totally unpredictable. You can have the biggest supercomputers crunching the numbers, but if it does not rain, you are finished. So, monsoon outcome is not known. State elections are due. 
what do you expect the man to do? He is not going to do big bang stuff. He is going to do marginal tweaking and he is going to sound hopeful. He is going to project optimism. And having done this, Prime Minister has buzzed off to BRICS summit. Mr. Jetley is busy with defense, which is a huge portfolio. Finance bill will take care of itself. It will go to that uh, Lok Sabha subcommittee, which comprises the members from Lok Sabha and Rajya Sabha. Those guys will debate all this. 31st July, there is something called guillotine, which is applied by the speaker, who will say, okay, demand for grants discussion is over. Finance Appropriation Act is passed and Finance Act is passed. And 1st of August 2014, we will have a completely new legal regime as far as all this is concerned. Correct? So, this is what is going to happen. One of the things which Professor Ram Mohan, sorry, I think I am exceeding my time. Sorry, two minutes more. One of the things which Professor Ram Mohan has said, is quoted Joseph Stiglitz, who is a Nobel laureate economist, generally great man and I uh, am sure all of you have heard the name. He, I believe, said, why are these populist measures popular? Populist measures are popular because they are popular. People want them. That is why every politician likes to do populist stuff because politicians deal with citizens. They do not deal with, you know, groups of citizens like middle class and upper class and all that. They deal with citizens at large. So, populist measures are a part of life in any system. We are going to have, we have populist measures, we will have more populist measures and it will probably increase as we go along. And Tamil Nadu is a world champion in populist measures. You step out of IIT gates, you can see populist measures. But it is going to happen. It is continuously going to happen funded by the taxpayers money. And what Mr. Jetley said, one of the things he said in the interview maybe or in the budget speech was that you know, we will do all this stuff, we are on the right track and hopefully two, three, two to three years from now, once the structural issues of the economy have been addressed, which have been touched upon by some of the other speakers, we may get to 7 to 8 percent growth, sustainable growth. Now, 7 to 8 percent growth rate for a giant economy is, you know, it is dangerous, it is terrifying. It is like a huge bus going at 100 kilometers per hour. A small motorbike going at 100 kilometers per hour, you do not notice it. If that guy crashes, he will kill himself. A bus going at 100 kilometers per hour, it crashes, 100 people may die. So, large economies cannot grow very fast unless you are in tight control. That is why the US economy, if it grows at more than 2 percent, people get worried. 15 trillion dollar economy, if it grows at 10 percent a year, there will be panic in the world. It just cannot, it cannot be done, it is just too big. So, there are related governance issues. You know, some of the things which, sorry, I will take two more minutes. Income tax. There are a whole host of cosmetic simplifications which can be done. You know, raising this limit, that limit and so on. There is a fundamental governance thing which can be done in income tax, which is that it has been studied in depth for so many years. I am sure you must have also studied this. This is a whole bunch of government employees right, central government and state governments. They are paid from what is called the Consolidated Fund of India or the Consolidated Fund of the states. This is like the ba large bank account of government of India with RBI. It is one big bank account, lots of numbers there. If they are being paid from the Consolidated Fund of India, the income tax which is collected from them is also deposited back into the Consolidated Fund of India. Now, does it make any sense in terms of organization structure or organizational dynamics to pay let us say you are an employee of government, I pay you with the right hand and I take back tax with the left hand. Does it make any sense? Is it not easier to make your salary tax free? By saying that your salary compensation level is based on the fact that you are getting tax free income. That is no sense in giving you 100 rupees and taking away 20 rupees. I can say your salary is 80, adjusted for tax, post tax. If you do that, I think 50 to 75 percent of the income tax department can be closed and sent home. Now, you know who is the biggest opponent of this? It is the employees of the income tax department. <laughs> Naturally, no? what will they do for their promotion prospects? If the department itself is reduced, it can be done overnight. It does not hurt anybody, it does not cost anything. I am told countries like Sri Lanka have already done this. Now, you start thinking, we claim that we are very bright. 
keep wondering whether those guys are little brighter. Then there was some reference to rationing food grain subsidies. You know, state like Tamil Nadu is something called universal PDS, which means every resident of the state can get subsidized rice and sugar and so on and so forth. Now, at least certainly none of us here deserve to get subsidized rice and sugar. Now, when I went, took my ration card to the, went to the ration office and said, I want to you know, surrender my food quota. You just give me what is called a white card for uh, just address purposes. That guy says, why? You can get subsidized rice and sugar. I said, I don't deserve it. He says, Lella, Lella, sir, parwala. you take it. <laughs> you know? Simple governance reform. You can say that if you are a taxpayer, you don't get this. If you are, if you are a taxpayer, you can take a ration car for address purposes, but you don't deserve to get subsidized rice, sugar, oil, oil, whatever they give. It will save a fortune. It will not hurt anybody. And uh, there is a lot of things which can be done in governance terms. So since all of you represent the future of this country and our time is in a sense done, maybe you should start thinking or devoting some thought to some of these issues. And maybe at some point of time in your life, you may be able to do something about things like this. And uh, instead of doing fine tuning on an existing system, can you do a fundamental change? Is it, can there be a paradigm shift in thinking? That's what I would like you to think about. Thanks very much. Thank you all. Uh, I think we'll now throw open uh, to the audience uh, the questions. I'd just like to make a couple of points before I throw open the question. I don't know if you're aware that there is this fiscal responsibility bill, uh, which India has been debating for the last, I don't know, 14, 15 years. Uh, I did want to touch upon it right in the beginning, where the fiscal deficit has to be contained below 3%. And right now, we are hoping to revamp it and again pass it uh, in the Lok Sabha and then Rajya Sabha. That will hopefully contain the spending and all the pro uh, proliferage that happens. So that is one. The second thing is, I s yeah, yeah. The second thing is, while campaigning, Modi was always talking about two economists that he was going to bring as his uh, reform gurus. I don't know if you were part of that. One was Jagdish Bhagwati. And the other was Arvind Panegriha. Both of them are believers in free market. And if you look at all that was suggested later, was only welfare-oriented programs. So you can talk about anyone uh, who can be your guiding force, but afterwards be absolutely populist, because ultimately you want to be in power. We already have a list of questions uh, which have come in. So I'll read them. Uh, and then we'll try and answer them depending on who can answer the question. Fund allocation for development projects like MNREGA has remained almost constant. Is economic growth taking precedence over holistic development? MNREGA has come in for a lot of criticism from the corporate sector. I don't know if you're aware of it. Uh, there's a little bit of history. Everything has a history. Nothing is in isolation. Many, many years ago, when we were younger, there used to be a thing called food for work, where there's lots of food grain stocks lying in the FCI go-downs. And people in the rural countryside were not having enough work. So the government decided to create this thing called food for work, where you pay people for doing productive work in the rural areas and give them food grains instead of cash. And then there was a small cash component. Like Maharashtra pioneered it by calling it employment guarantee scheme. Then it was extended to the whole country. MNREGA is nothing more than the food for work plus plus, like C plus plus. Now, what has happened as a result of MNREGA is that when you see these things, often government schemes work beautifully in a small uh, pilot project where it's intensively supervised. Some of these things are not scalable across the country. You're familiar with the scalability business, right? Everything the government does has to be scalable across the country, across every one of the 535 districts. Because you cannot discriminate and say, OK, I won't do in this district. So what has happened is MNREG, I think, promises 120 rupees per day or some, some money like that. Maybe the number is wrong, but whatever it is. 
So it has reached a stage where people in the rural areas are not going to work in factories and you know for harvesting and so on and so forth because they are saying that I have already paid my agent 20 rupees out of the 120, I am collecting 100 rupees for not doing any work. Why should I come and work for you and actually collect the 120? So it's gotten distorted. Nothing wrong in principle, but execution is where we fail. And execution across the country, across geographies, across time zones, climate zones, is all very difficult. Only execution which Government of India can do very successfully across the country is an election. That is because it's only over two days. It is not possible for any government anywhere in the world to do everything perfectly across its entire geography. So this is why MNREGA ideally, personal feeling is it should be maybe struck down and done something, do something else. But as I said, politics takes precedence. You cannot abruptly close down a scheme. Then you will be branded anti-poor. So allocation in nominal terms is the same thing. Much of it may not be spent. I'll pick a few of these questions here. We'll uh, also pass the mic around. Uh, ask one question, please, and direct your question to the panelists. Good evening, ma'am. My question, is, my question is to you only. Ma'am, uh, you spoke about 18% uh, of subsidy. Uh, you know, this is uh, subsidies as uh, being branded as one of the, uh, where, uh, where it's more of, you know, expenditure without any this thing, uh, returns. So, why not, rather than uh, going for uh, uh, reducing subsidy on gas cylinders, why not fixing the link, uh, leakages like in uh, fertilizer subsidy, then even in uh, M, uh, uh, MG, R, yeah. In that also, why not, you know, rather than uh, uh, digging a uh, pit and filling it up, why not, you know, connect it with the more productive, this thing, which has been uh, envisioned by the government? See, when you uh, look at the 18% of the revenue expenditure, uh, which goes into subsidy. A very careful document has been made and we have understood that which are the ones which go to the low poverty line people, BPL families. Uh, I think most of the people, whether politically speaking or economically speaking, agree that to the BPL families it is fine to go for that. The allocation for MNREGS is separate from the subsidy bill. What we are talking about is when the subsidy actually goes to people who are above the BPL families, one can eliminate that completely. And I think a discussion was made by Mr. Prakash Damodaran saying that it looks like politically maybe they feel we cannot take that step right away. I think that seems to be the general point. Economists are of the complete uh, view that this can be completely taken off. For example, diesel, the subsidy on diesel. There, are, there is a view that maybe diesel subsidy, if removed, can have a cascading effect on inflation. I don't think it will. Second is the gas cylinder. All this, that will impact reduction and that will free money to get into capital expenditure. Because only when there is capital expenditure, there will be a fiscal stimulus and which will cause growth. So only from a macro perspective, I can look at the whole thing because you want growth. Only when there is growth, there will be tax buoyancy. Only when there is tax buoyancy, will they be able to borrow lesser. Only then the economy will, you know, the whole thing, it's a vicious circle. We are really caught in that vicious circle. So there are ways and means of reducing tax subsidy. And I think we have lost that chance this year. They are saying maybe next year. So it looks like they are looking at it politically. Good evening, all of you. So I have two questions actually. One is uh, to anyone. So there's something called Statue of Unity to, which has been proposed in this uh, budget to which they have allocated around 200 crore rupees if I'm not wrong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. While important proposals like setting up of AIMS and all, they have been given a budget of 100 crores. So my question is, why so much money has Politics. been given? Okay. So how does, how do, what is the, uh, out, what, what do we gain out of it? Politics. Like, there's no other, nothing gained. Okay. And uh, I, I can't see a rational. I wish I could give you a better answer. It is. Don't you think Sardar Vallabhai Patel's contribution to the country deserves to be recognized? He is the one who put the union together. Yes, sir, definitely. Yeah, but then my question is why such a huge budget for the same thing? Okay, and second question to uh, Mr. Murli. There's something called GST, goods and service taxes, which has been discussed a lot. 
So why, what is the big deal about it and why is it touted to be a like big game turner? Like if you can just throw some light on that. See, what happened here, GST is, uh, he has told that before this end of this year, he will do it. But then, some of the states will be losing, that's what the fear. They have to be compensated with a huge money, which has been promised by the previous finance minister, in fact. And that particular budget, whatever he has allotted, allocated now, it's a very peanuts when compared to what Mr. P. Chidambaram, uh, he has assured, in fact. But what he has assured itself is only a tip of the iceberg when you take into consideration the state's claims. Especially certain states which are efficiently run as far as tax administration is concerned, they feel they will be losing. This is what they say. So, uh, that is why there is a hesitation. There is a uncooperation from the non-cooperation from the state's perspective as far as CSG is concerned. Is goods and service tax. So, uh, this is like a forward looking question. Uh, in the uh, months leading up to the budget, uh, there was a huge rumor in uh, national newspapers that a huge subsidy is being uh, brought upon worth, uh, uh, for the clean tech sector, mainly renewables, electric vehicles, stuff like those. So, somehow it did not materialize the current budget. So, uh, my question to the panelists is this, what do you see uh, in the future happening uh, in this green tech sector? Uh, it is futuristic. Uh, because if you look at what's happening in the so-called developed world, there is a lot of research because there's lots of research dollars are available to them. But commercially, clean tech is still, I don't know, I mean, uh, the engineers here probably have a better handle on how far or how near we are uh, to uh, clean tech. But honestly, you know, it's a question of priorities. Uh, we're talking about feeding our poor. So does that take precedence or does, you know, clean tech take precedence is, again, a huge political debate, right, which is not going to get resolved anytime soon. So, you know, hopefully, Sorry? What's your outlook? My outlook? Well, I, I think it will always be, not always be, but in the foreseeable future, at least in my lifetime, it will only be fringe. Right? I hope a lot more will happen, but I think the reality is it won't. Because, and you know, I, I can give you my very limited experience. In our offices, we've installed, uh, you know, solar panels. Uh, I think roughly 80% of the lighting in our corporate office is, uh, you know, solar lighting, of which we are very proud. But really, does it make a difference to this country? I don't think so, right? These are feel-good things that we do. But for that reason, I wouldn't stop putting money into research. I think we should. But I think we need to be realistic about how soon this will become something really big. I hope that answers your question. See, there's a very interesting question put here. Uh, and I'd like to answer that uh, because it has something to do with uh, education. Two uh, questions, though, but connected. Uh, how does the expansion of having more IITs and IIMs help? Uh, does it not deteriorate the quality of education? It says, I don't know why you're asking that. Uh, I'd like to answer it in, a, in several contexts. Well, I see, I, I don't know if you know the rhetoric of uh, BJP. They said we're going to bring every state an IIT and every state an IIM. Is it good or bad? Right now we have several IITs and IIMs in several, several states. If you see in the last two, three years, one major problem they face is lack of faculty. And uh, this has been a problem because of several reasons. Long term, if we look at 10, 15, 20 years from today, I think India requires good educational institutions. Either it has to be funded by the corporate or it has to be funded by the government. So I don't see uh, it a problem. And I see education as a long run investment, not a sh as a short run investment. 
in that sense, I see it as a good and a progressive way of thinking. So I can't see it as a bad way of thinking. Having said that, there's another question which is related. Why are they not investing enough in primary education? So uh, it's like an opportunity cost. And I do this as a case study when I do macroeconomics in my own institution. So you, everyone has scarce resources. So is it in higher education or in primary education? And if you look at the model in many other countries, whether it be Singapore or whether you look at USA, et cetera, higher education is most of the time corporate funded or own funded. And why is India going this way? Right now, with the opening of the WTO, it is expected that international universities are going to come to India. So it really looks like competition is going to open up. And the next five to 10 years is really going to be busy and competitive. So let them compete, and the best will survive. This is my take on it. My question is directed to Prakash Ramadran. Sir, you mentioned uh, that the government shied away from a fundament, uh, fundamental change uh, and it was l like the government focused on the cherry rather than the cake. Can you, so, does can the, you speak yeah. Uh, as you mentioned, sir, that the government shied away from a fundamental change. Uh, uh, does that make you pessimistic? Because this, this was like the best opportunity that the government had in, in the last 30 years to make like a fundamental change because they have, they sh surely had a clear majority with 282 states. Uh, 282 seats. So, uh, did you? Does that make you pessimistic about the future? No, actually, not at all. I gave you that example of a ship. Now, many of us may not have travelled by ship, but most of us may have travelled in a plane, right? A large uh, transport aircraft. So, anybody from aero background? Okay. When you design a fighter aircraft, you are told that it should be unstable; otherwise, it cannot be manoeuvrable. And dynamics and stability, they teach you this stuff, right? So when you travel as a passenger in a large aircraft, let's say uh, Airbus 330 or something, and suddenly this guy dives from 33,000 feet, cruising altitude to 10,000 feet, you think that airline will be popular? Do you even notice the descent? Or do you even notice a turn? Actually, maybe he's banking at 30 degrees. Do you notice it? You don't notice it. When you're sitting in a motorbike and you do a 30 degree bank, you notice it. So a large economy cannot do abrupt shifts. It is just not possible. Plus, one more uh, internal secret of a budget. I mean, I'm not letting out state secrets. See, these budget documents, there is this famous Newton's second law of motion, which they teach you long back. There's momentum. And what is the law? It says you have to apply a huge amount of force to deviate the direction, basically. So, second law, no? Yeah, I keep forgetting. So, there is a momentum for the economy. It's in a particular path. You have to apply enormous amount of force, which means really using up enormous amount of political capital to make even small changes. Now, you accumulated huge amount of political capital by virtue of winning the election and getting goodwill of the people. You don't want to blow it all in one go, especially when there are three state elections coming up in the next two months. You want to wait. Maybe in the next election, I mean next budget, 28th of February 2015, you may see a few more drastic changes. Finally, as I said, this budget document is not a big deal. Nobody within the government takes this budget document seriously. Nobody even reads it. It's only the people outside of government who read it. Because the people within the government know what it is worth. Earlier, they would get bunches of paper. Now, mercifully, it's downloadable. Nobody downloads all this. <laughs> That's because if some department wants to do something, they will do it outside the budget. And when you have an economy which is, what, $3 trillion in size, 100 crores is not even rounding off error. Nobody bothers about 100 crores. The last problem of government, I'm not letting out a state secret, the last problem of government is money. Money is never a problem for anything worthwhile. You want 200 crores, you can get it in five minutes, provided you have a clear plan of how you to use it. So two, 300 crores for a statue is nothing. It's not even rounding off error. 
write down 13 trillion, 3 trillion dollars, multiply it by 61 and multi write down the number, see how big it is. It's nothing, don't even worry about it. So all these things don't matter at all. And you can hide a lot of things within this. And you can run whole departments without budgets. There are lots of tricks of the trade, but we won't go into all that now. Sir. Just one, one other point. Uh, as Prakash was saying earlier, there's too much hoopla around, you know, this event of budget. The business of government, as I understand it, and the business of reform is a long and often tortuous process. It is not a single event. It is not even a series of events. So ideally, many of the changes that we dream of, you know, many of the things that we aspire to, are things which can, which can and should happen in the day-to-day -day business of governance. See, liberalization of insurance, FDI, did not need to be part of the budget. It has nothing to do with the budget, right? There is an act called the Insurance Act. That act has to be amended, for which you have to go to the Lok Sabha and then to the Rajya Sabha. The budget, as he said, is a ways and means statement. The policy statements have nothing to do with the budget. Therefore, I think, I mean, just, just to sort of set the balance right, we shouldn't judge the government and the finance minister too harshly, saying that he has missed a golden opportunity. Every day is an opportunity, right? And the fact that they pushed through this bill on the prime minister's uh, principal advisor, yeah, this is a brilliant example, right? I mean, so stuff keeps happening. So this is really about, you know, how you manage PR, how you manage people, how you manage your opposition, so on and so forth. So I, I wouldn't be too pessimistic and say, oh God, you know, now till 28th February 2015, nothing will happen. Not so. Sir, uh, I have a question. Uh, it's open to all the panelists. So like, uh, we have been talking about uh, retrospective taxes and all that. Uh, like, uh, the, the main motto of bigging up the retrospective taxes is to ensure that the corporates pay their taxes uh, whenever necessary like as in take the case of Vodafone like they are supposed to pay around like 80,000 crores for the transfer of Hutch to Vodafone or something so like uh, when they are not uh, in the budget speech Mr. Jaitley said that uh, the government will not uh, uh, take steps retrospecti uh, retrospectively uh, that means he is definitely in uh, against retrospective taxes. Uh, and one more thing is uh, like it has also enter, uh, uh, entered uh, arbitration with uh, uh, Vodafone and all that which the previous government did not. So does all this, what I want to say through this, like does all this mean that the government is trying to uh, side towards corporates and taking the step of taxing the poor uh, and not the rich? And uh, is the government, uh, like not just this, uh, through various other plans like uh, dilution of labor law, uh, dilution of land acquisition law, all this makes the government, no, yeah, so like uh, does, does the government is mo uh, moving towards a, a place where it is trying to tax the poor and not the rich. It is trying to side towards the corporates more and not the people more. Like as I said, 2 million people are taxable and uh, less are all not taxable. Uh, your question is right. Here, what you say in the retrospective amendment, he said the sovereign right of the government in uh, enacting laws retrospectively he is not denying, but he said there should not be uncertainty. It is called the ease of doing business. If suppose if the MNCs you you require for to get funds, you want foreign direct investment, you want high net worth individuals should come and invest. Having invested putting up infrastructure, putting up factory, doing all the Lusians, the uh, single window system, everything has been done. Finally, when the profit comes, they are given a promise, 100% exemption. Then they say, minimum book profit tax. What we said, the exemption, it is not applicable here, they say. So what the left hand gives, right hand takes away. What the right hand gives, left hand takes away. And it is a retrospective one. So if there is a dispute in the interpretation, they will go to tribunal. After the assessment is over, the highest from the thing, then you go to high court, then you go to Supreme Court, and in the Supreme Court, after they have given a decision about the interpretation, 
the government comes with retrospective go back at 20 years. So, putting everything into naught. So, what will happen in the uh, two countries when they are talking about bilateral relation and all they are trying to bring in this one because individually everybody got disgusted and that is why if you have authority for advance ruling which he has introduced for domestic companies also foreign companies also what is the thing I want to tell you briefly that is why I took this mic. Suppose assuming if you are buying goods for your company from somebody you are giving what is you will have an invoice you will have a purchase invoice that is the basis of your calculation of your trading account manufacturing account whatever it is. But as far as related undertakings are concerned when there is a holding company subsidiary company or a group of uh, conglomerate is concerned what they are doing your invoice is not accepted. They have got a particular policy where you have to adopt the rate interrelated undertaking arms length price all those things have been defined whereby the government will adopt there is certain rates have been given. So, as per that consistent rate average cost or whatever it is they have to adopt if it is an interrelated undertaking because they may be preparing a global balance sheet. What happened most of the tax disputes are there mostly all the MNCs are having causing swords now. So, what happened they, they given a complaint the finance ministry last 6 months because this is an IIT you must understand this what they have done they formed one authority for advance ruling whereby they what they have said they have given up the right ok you do not adopt my price you fix a price you fix a price immediately you fix a price do not do it in assessment afterwards you, you do it within a reasonable period they said but the government sleeping they have not taken any action 302 cases have been filed under the authority for advance ruling some of the European countries who followed this the total number never exceeded 2, number 2 that is all 1, 2 or nil because nobody wants to give it up. But here they want peace because if an entrepreneur upstart people many of you may start a company. So, with the liability nobody will buy there is a huge tax liability have been slapped. So, this in this background only you have to see 2012 not only retrospective amendment not only uh, that is authority for advance ruling will be strengthened settlement commission Wanchu committee recommendation they said there should be an arbitration procedure properly all these things is strengthening it as such. So, what I want to tell you by giving said that authority for advance ruling or retrospective amendment is not there that means it is a pro rich and then it is anti poor you try to raise the question you have to change it. The idea is we require everything infrastructure to be strengthened means foreign direct investment should flow. Once you have the promissory of estoppel is there, once you give a promise you have to adhere. If it is not there totally the ease of doing business will go, uncertainty will be there, democratic sword will be hanging, nobody will bring the fund. Can I give you a, I give you a simple uh, example? I mean this is very technical, I will give you a very simple example. When you what, uh, what course are you doing MBA? Uh, mechanical engineering, right. So, you have been told that if you get 75 percent in your final exam, you have got distinction. That is the basis on which you join this course. That is the basis on which you prepare. You have gone and done your exam. You are very certain that you are going to get 75, right. On the day your paper is being handed out, your head calls you and tells you that 75 means fail, right. I mean because he is the boss. He calls you and says, sorry. When you join that might have been the rule, but today I am telling you 75 equals fail. How will you feel? And uh, by the company which is which has already come through FTI, it is uh, both the companies are exempted from tax before before this uh, amendment of income tax law. Does this sound logical? We in our country are paying tax, but some other corporates are coming inside and not not at all paying. No, no, it's. It's not about it's not about corporate. It's not about foreigners. It's about none of that. It is about transparency. If if you make it clear that these are the terms on which you can do business in this country, then everybody comes in with their eyes wide open. In this case, they did not. They were told you can come into this country and do business. They were not told that this will be taxed. But after the fact, you go and change the law. This is exactly what. I, how will you feel? 
Uh, no, no, it's not anti. Now, no, no, that's your decision. If if you want, as he said, if you want money to come into the country, you make your country friendly. Now, for example, in the in the example that I gave you, if they said 75 is fail, and word gets around, nobody will come and join here because they don't know what will happen tomorrow, right? So you have to make the informed judgment as to do you want to make this people this place friendly for people to come? If yes, make it transparent. Nobody is saying zero tax. All they are saying is please make the rules of the game clear so that we know what rules we are playing under. I, I think we will uh, take one final question if there is one. Good evening all. Uh, my question is that is it necessary for us to spend 750 crores for uh, towards the Mangalyan and Chandra, Chandrayan whereas many people are starving to death. I mean, I mean we are allotting this. Uh, I mean, it's a part of budget, right? Whereas many people are starving to death in slums without having adequate infrastructure and if we can allot much more funds to, uh, towards primary education and at grassroots level, we can have better literacy rate and employment. Is it necessary for us to spend 750 crores towards those missions? Okay, I'll ask you a counter question. <laughs> yeah, please. No, just to put it in perspective. See, the IITs are elite education institutions, right? And the government spends, I don't know, how much, 200 crores per year on IIT Madras itself? 230. So you add all the original five IITs, it's a 1,000 crores. And how many students are there? Hardly any compared to large universities. IIT's total uh, graduation strength is around 7,000. Around 7,000 now. When I studied, it was uh, less than 1,000 or something. Right. So it's an elite institution. So why should we have it? If I were finance minister, I will close down IIT Madras and use this 230 crores to give water to the poor people. <laughs> Would that be okay? I mean, it is in line with your thinking. No, 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 sir, actually. <laughs> and if I were government, I will demolish all these buildings. There are 630 acres here. And there are a lot of slums in Chennai. I will build slum clearance board uh, tenements here. It's a good place. And people can live in peace. <laughs> in, uh, you know, in harmony with the environment and so on. Would that be okay? No, in which way we are going to get benefited? It may be after a long time. No, no, no. I am talking of tomorrow. We can demolish it tomorrow. <laughs> but that creates unemployment and... Uh, no, no. Only you guys will be out of employment. <laughs> <laughs> Number is very small. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> See, we are finally a country. This is not uh, some chota mota, you know, tea shop. There is also prestige. Countries need to project prestige. When you go to an interview, why do you shave, put on a shirt, tie and shoe and everything? Do you go like this? Why? Are you not being true to yourself by simply going in jeans and chappal? Because each thing requires a particular way of presenting. When uh, Prime Minister goes abroad, he takes a plane and goes. He charters a plane and goes. For which the government pays. You can also argue why should he charter a plane. He can go by this Air India, buy the economy class ticket. Which Moraji Desai did incidentally. And what Air India did was they cancelled the tickets of all the other fellows. <laughs> and, and had to give them hotel accommodation and an alternate flight and taxi fare back home. <laughs> See, there is a saying that Gandhi, poor man, Gandhiji was uh, epitome of poverty and simple living and all that stuff. There is a saying in uh, British India that the government spent a fortune to keep him in poverty. So we shouldn't, uh, you know, okay, any number of examples I can give you. Why do we, uh, see, why should the IIT director have a car? He can go by bicycle. Why should we have air conditioning here? Does a poor man have air conditioning? You can have a fan or you can have that, you know, visery. <laughs> there was this thing, na? George Fernandez was a long time back when he was minister first time. He, there was talk of appropriate technology. So he said appropriate is context dependent. He says when I go for a meeting from Calcutta to Delhi, he says I don't go by bullock cart, I take a plane. He said that is appropriate technology for that. 
for each thing there is something appropriate. Now, space and uh, military and so on and so forth have infinite spin-offs, which you and I may not be aware of. For example, the famous net that you use to update your Facebook status every three minutes. Who invented it? Who invented packet switching? Who funded it? It was done by the military and by the government. If they had known that all of you will be using this only to you know, download uh, XXX videos and as they are <laughs> updating Facebook status, they would have never invented it. So each thing there is something called appropriate. So just keep it in mind. This is actually a great achievement and if you see this uh, precision of that launch in a country which is so imprecise and so dirty and so disorganized, it's a sight to see. You feel proud to be an Indian. If you go and see the nuclear reactor in Kalpakam, if you get a chance, do it. With a lot of uh, maneuvering, I went and had a look at it. The place is fantastic. You know, it's like another planet. After coming out, those guys said, how do you like it? I said, almost, you know, for the first or second time in my life, I'm really proud to be an Indian. Because to think that we have done something like this, which is so precise, it's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. Sending something to Mars is not a joke, yeah? I think on behalf of the panel, I will, uh, I think we all enjoyed it very much. So I'll thank the panel and I thank all the students for this very nice evening. Thank you. Okay, now, I would like to take this opportunity on behalf of IIT Madras as well as Extra Middle Lectures to immensely thank uh, every panelist who has taken time out of their schedules to be here. Uh, may I now call upon Professor Ellis Ganesh to felicitate the panelists. First, uh, Mr. T.P. Srinivas Raghavan. Mr. Prakash Damodaran. Mr. Murli. Professor Lakshmi Kumar. Thank you, one and all. In case you have any other questions regarding the budget, you can always post it on our Facebook page, Extramural Lectures IIT Madras.